introduce our last speaker today, um, Clarissa Cooper, MS, LPC, NCC, CCH, CDBT, is a licensed professional counselor in Atlanta, Georgia, where she's the clinical director of North Atlanta DBT LLC. This conference's audience may be aware that the majority of Black adults with serious mental illness will not receive mental health treatment, and that access, stigma, and prejudice are some of the many roadblocks to getting care for members of that community. Ms. Cooper has a deep commitment to expanding the accessibility of dialectical behavior therapy with clients who are Black, Indigenous, and or people of color, and also in supporting Black women, individuals who identify as part of the LGBTGEQ plus community, community organizers, and social justice activists. Ms. Cooper's work is also informed by her prior professional work in the women's reproductive health field and by Black feminist and healing justice frameworks. I think the themes she's going to be discussing today will really resonate with what we just heard from Angela Harvey about her own experiences. After seeing Ms. Cooper speak at the International Society for the Improvement and Teaching of DBT last fall, this conference team could not wait to invite her to speak with us today. So here to talk with us about applying an anti-racist framework in dialectical behavior therapy, please welcome Ms. Clarissa Cooper. All right, hello everyone, good afternoon. You have been here all day, we are almost done and we're gonna talk about some really, really valuable and important concepts. Um, important things for you to know are that I am from um, unceded Muscogee and Creek territory in what is now known as Atlanta, Georgia. Um, and my practice operates from a DBT hypnotherapy and somatic therapy approach where I also weave in liberation, just, social justice and liberation oriented therapies and theories in the work that I'm doing with my clients. So back last year, June, 2020, Armida Frazetti and Aditi Vijay did a really wonderful presentation with NEA BPD that talked about racism as an extreme invalidating environment. And then soon after that, there was a really wonderful article from Pearson, Aaron Gary, and Bond that actually came out of Yale that talked about anti-racist adaptations that therapists can make when they are working with clients of color. So what I've chosen to do today is to move forward from the concept that racism is an invalidating environment and that therapists need to make adjustments within the DBT framework that honors an anti-racist framework to talking about what does that look like in the work that I do with my clients, working primarily with black folks, indigenous folks, and other people of color and other intersecting identities. So we're going to talk about the fact that the identity, um, we're going to identify, excuse me, the importance of including client experiences of racism and oppression in our case conceptualizations of clients. We're going to talk about the necessity of applying an anti-racist therapeutic framework and specific concepts of anti-racist therapy and how there are intersections and ways that these concepts weave into an anti-racist DBT approach. So one of the questions that I frequently ask my clients when we first start working in um, from a DBT framework is, what does it mean to reclaim a life worth living in a world that's hell bent on exploiting, criminalizing, and killing you? So within the DBT framework with working with borderline personality disorder, many of us are familiar with that life worth living question, right? What would make life worth living so that you would step away from any of your ineffective, unhealthy, or maladaptive coping behaviors? What might help you get recommitted to life? And so this is a question that I ask my clients, but I have to recognize that we are operating in a world that is filled with oppression. And so if that's the case, I can ask my clients to be reconnected, but what am I asking them to be reconnected to? So it requires me to have an awareness and to name that we live in an environment in a world that exploits, that criminalizes, and that actively kills and normalizes at times the deaths of Black, Indigenous bodies and people of color. 
So as we move forward, I'm asking you to agree to a few understandings. One is that race is a social construct and that it is a hierarchy. It's a hierarchy and a spectrum that places at the top whiteness and sees that as good. And it places at the bottom blackness and sees that as bad. All right, so we're gonna be operating from an idea of anti-blackness on one end, uplifting, emboldening whiteness on the other extreme, and that others fall in between that spectrum in some way. Right? That racism operates from a caste-based system that places, again, whiteness at the top and sees whiteness as the default. So others are seen, other identities are seen as other, they're seen as less than, they are seen as different than. I'm also asking you to think about this from a systems-based perspective, right? We are individuals who are operating in systems. We're in systems in our family community. We are in systems in our work relationships and communities. We're in systems or groups and clusters of individuals operating and working together from a societal standpoint as well. Right. And so that means that anti-Black racism and the differential treatment and hierarchies that come along with that, again, lead others to be, uh, lead to Black folks, Indigenous folks, and people of color to be othered. And so we have to ask who has power within the system, who has privilege within the system, and then who then is disadvantaged because they do not have power, they do not have privilege within that system. So when we're talking about being anti-racist, we have to recognize that we are talking about addressing racist attitudes, we're talking about addressing racist beliefs, and we're talking about addressing racist actions. We have to address all points and all factors. If we change our thinking, but we don't change our action, that doesn't necessarily lead to any change in an individual's life, and it doesn't lead to systemic change either. We're also asking folks to address and change any oppressive and racist systems that they're operating in. So the therapist must operate as an individual support for the client in therapy and as an advocate for that client and for marginalized communities outside of the therapy room as well. If we're operating from a place of true liberation, it requires us to understand and to address the various intersection of individuals' identities, individuals' privileges, and individuals' experiences of oppression, both the clients and our own as clinicians. So we talked a lot about intersectionality. Angela spoke about intersectionality, right? Where are the different ways that people's identities can intersect or stack onto one another, right? We've got race and ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation and economic status, religion, spirituality, disability status, immigration status, relationship status, we're also needing to pay attention to how does society and individuals treat folks with different body sizes and different body shapes, right? How are people's facial features seen? How are people's facial features and skin color privileged or disadvantaged? And so as I'm doing anti-racist liberation work with my clients, I can't only focus on race and ethnicity. I have to pay attention to all the other intersections that my clients show up in therapy with. I have to pay attention to my own intersections. What are the ways that I have privilege and what are the ways that I have power? And also what are the ways that I might be disadvantaged within the dynamic with my client? Mm -hmm. Another concept that we have to pay attention to and understand is that if a person is a part of a marginalized or a minority group, they experience minority stress. They experience levels of trauma, levels of stress due to how society engages, how society views, how society treats those folks. Right. Additionally, there is courtesy stigma. This is about folks who operate as allies, individuals who operate as advocates for marginalized groups that they also, depending on what environment they're in, might also experience pushback and lashback from others who have power within the system. 
And so folks with minority stress and also those who experience courtesy stigma have increased rates of psychological distress. That includes suicidal behaviors, low self-esteem, withdrawal from social interactions, medical conditions, substance abuse, HIV AIDS and hate crimes is very, very prevalent within communities of LGBTQ folks and gender expansive folks. Folks who are unhoused, research shows that they can have a decrease in cognitive functioning. And there's also, of course, depression, anxiety, and potential somatization, or the ways that the body experiences emotion. So what I'm asking you to consider is that if we're paying attention to people's identities and the intersections of their identities and how society responds to those folks, we have to pay attention to how are we conceptualizing how the person is showing up in therapy and what their issues are. So Riz Mominican, who is a wonderful somatic therapist, a lot of us might know him because this last year, his book, um, My Grandmother's Hands, became a very popular book um, in anti-racism work. He says that trauma decontextualized in a person looks like personality. Trauma decontextualized in a family looks like family traits. And trauma in a people looks like culture. What I'm asking us to consider is what does it look like to maintain an awareness of oppression as the context that our loved ones who are people of color and have borderline personality disorder, right? What is that context that they're living in? And how does oppression filter in and impact the context? If I'm working with a client who has borderline personality disorder and a lot of her suicidality is rooted in being a black woman who experiences oppression and every time she turns on the TV or very frequently when she turns on the TV or goes into social media, she sees that another black or brown person has been murdered. I have to pay attention to how that informs and impacts her commitment to living. I have to pay attention to how that informs her suicidality. I can't just say, hey, let's get committed to life. What's gonna make your life worth living when the world is sending the message that your life is less valuable, it is less worthwhile, and that the world is sending them the message that you are less human, right? I have to be able to hold space for all of these things at the same time as I'm working with my clients. So if we're gonna operate from an anti-racist standpoint, a good foundation is to start with the multicultural and social justice counseling competencies. What do we as therapists have to show up with in the room to be able to do effective work with folks who are black, indigenous, and people of color? We have to first understand the complexities of diversity and multiculturalism on the counseling relationship. What are the dynamics? We have to understand people's histories and people's cultures. We have to recognize the negative influence of oppression on mental health and well-being. We have to understand the individuals in the context of their social environment. And their social environment can be their families, their friends, their work, right? It can be the larger cultural environment and also the larger societal environment as well. We also have to integrate a social justice advocacy framework into how we're doing therapy. What does it look like for me as a black therapist to advocate for my clients who are also black? What does it look like for me as a cisgender therapist to advocate for my clients who are trans or gender expansive? One of the things that we're doing here is trying to move away from just a cultural competence framework because cultural competence places, again, whiteness as the default and sees other identities as other sees different identities as other, right? And so it can lead to folks building lots of knowledge, but also lots of stereotypical knowledge that sees individual cultures as a monolith and doesn't see the nuance. It can also leave folks having lots of knowledge and feeling like they know things, but not actually putting into action things that are gonna to lead to societal change and also impact the relationship within therapy. So we're 
going to use a contextual lens that allows a multi-level approach to working with our clients. We are ultimately trying to merge together a biopsychosocial model that pays attention to people's biological predispositions if they have borderline personality disorder, right? High emotional sensitivity, high emotional intensity, right? High reactivity, slow return to baseline. I'm paying attention to the social environment, right? And oftentimes when I see and hear therapists doing DBT with clients and talking about the biosocial theory, they're talking about family of origin. They're talking about, you know, religious communities and their local communities, but the folks that they are with on a regular basis. What I'm asking us to do is actually merge a biosocial psychosocial model with the socio-ecological model that allows us to kind of lift up and go beyond just the immediate community and start to look at the larger community and the larger society as a whole. We're merging the two. So y'all, I'm very proud of my visual right here. You don't know how long it took me to figure out how to get this together. So, you know, I'm very proud of myself. I just needed to highlight that. So, We've got, as we oftentimes see in DBT, our Venn diagram that shows our dialectics, right? So we've got biological vulnerabilities and we've got interpersonal factors. This is what we usually focus on when we do the, bio, the biopsychosocial theory in DBT, right? What, is, what are these immediate relationships like for you? What I'm asking us to do is to add in this new domain, which is the societal and systemic factors as well. Okay, so we've got, again, biopsychosocial, what's happening on a day-to-day, person-to-person level, but also what's happening in this larger culture, in this larger environment that our clients are working in. How is that invalidation that they're receiving informing how they view themselves, how they view their relationships with other people, and how they're able to engage with and trust folks in the world? So as we continue talking about a multicultural and a social justice practice, again, moving beyond just cultural competence, we're looking at what are the different domains that we as counselors have to be able to develop in? What are the ways that we need to grow so that we can show up and support our clients more effectively? One is we've got to increase our self-awareness. Right? What are the ways, again, that we hold privilege? What are the ways that we hold power? What are the ways that we are disadvantaged? And what are our beliefs about moving through the world, right? I, I am clearly aware that I have an anti-capitalist view, worldview. That has potential to impact and show up in the work I do with a client who runs a Fortune 500 company. It has shown up in the work that I've done with a client who runs a Fortune 500 company where he is all about making money and I'm all about saying, well, let's talk about wealth redistribution. What might that look like, right? I've got to pay attention to how do my values, my worldview, my experiences and my identities show up and inform the work that I'm doing with clients. Where do I encourage the client to move and to consider a different perspective and how they show up in the world and how that impacts others? I also have to be willing to be impacted and moved by my client as well. I have to be aware of my client's worldview. How do they see themselves, right? If I have a client who is a black woman who doesn't think that racism is that big of a deal, doesn't think that her life has been impacted in any real way and that black folks, we talk about race too much, y'all. And I operate from a liberation focused perspective that is anti-oppression based there's going to be some interesting dynamics and conversations that come up in the work that I do with my client, potentially, right? So I want to always be paying attention to what do I believe? How do I show up in the world? What does my client believe? How does my client show up in the world? And what's valid about both of our perspectives? And where's the middle ground? Where's the dialectic? I have to pay attention to what's happening within the counseling relationship and what's happening in our dynamics. Right? I always let my clients know when we first start working together, I communicate very directly. I tend to have a lot of energy. Um, I don't quite bite my tongue very often. And I kind of just say things as they are. 
that's my culture. That's how I was raised. And that's something that I actually really love about myself, that I'm authentic and I don't beat around the bush. Although I wonder if there might be something problematic about that saying. I actually need to look it up and see if that's problematic. Right. But I communicate directly. That's something that I communicate to my clients up front who might come from cultures where direct communication might be seen as a bit more uncomfortable or a bit more threatening. Right. I name, hey, this is how I communicate thoughts and feelings about that. Do you have any concerns? Let's talk about what it might look like. What do you need me to do differently? How do you need me to communicate in a different way? Also, I want you to know that there's plenty of space, there's plenty of room for you to let me know if I have done or said something that just doesn't quite feel really good. I want to talk about that. I want to navigate that. Right? Because in the work that I'm doing with my clients, I am consistently talking about how is oppression impacting my clients, whether they are a BIPOC client or a person who has a marginalized identity or if they're not, that's always coming into the room with the work I do with my clients. And so I have to make space for communicating and talking about really uncomfortable things, especially when we might have a difference in opinion. And I'm also talking about counseling and advocacy interventions. What are the things that I might need to do outside of my session with clients to advocate for them? What does it look like to advocate for my trans clients? What does it look like to engage in mutual aid to support communities that I know might have less resources, especially in the midst of COVID? So I've got a few quotes kind of sprinkled throughout that I just really love and I think really make the point. So Rats is one of our, Rats et al, he and all his folks, um, they um, have done a lot of research around uh, cultural competence and social justice right? and multicultural counseling. They say counselors must strive to become aware of their cultural values, beliefs, and biases. This internal awareness then extends to counselors' understanding of their client's worldview and subsequently the ways in which culture, power, privilege, and oppression influence the counseling relationship. So what makes therapy work? These are things that we know. The therapeutic alliance being strong, there being opportunities for growth and change, and the therapist believing that the client is able to grow and change and sending that message. There being empathy, there being warmth, a sense of a caring environment. The client being able to learn skills and being able to develop and grow and see themselves actually using the things that they're learning and having positive outcomes because of it. I have to be able to set a clear rationale for understanding what's going on, having a treatment plan, having clear expectations around what I think is gonna happen in therapy and what progress and growth I think is possible. I also have to be willing to make cultural adaptations of treatment. And as a DBT therapist, the reality is there is not a lot of research out here about DBT with communities of color. It's just not a lot, it doesn't exist. Okay, there are hmm, five studies, six studies maybe, All right? As an evidence-based practice that was normed around a dominant culture, right? It means that in my black women's DBT skills group, we have to make some adaptations when we're talking about the skills. We have to find ways to apply all of the different skills to what it means to operate in an anti-racist liberatory framework. Right? What does it mean to radically accept that the world is oppressive? What does it mean to accept that you might experience disadvantaged experiences and opportunities? What does it mean for me to say, and what comes up often is when we're talking about dialectics, where is the truth in a white supremacist framework? Like, can you please, Clarissa, help me understand how is a white supremacist viewpoint valid? Right? That's going to come up in my Black women's skills group. And what I have to say is, well, yeah, it's hard to do. And I imagine that there is a reason that this person has somehow developed this perspective. While the perspective itself might be flawed, the development of the belief that I can understand if you didn't grow up around people of color, if you grew up in an environment that was racist, right? Then it makes sense that they're going to pick up a problematic belief. So the belief itself 
invalid. The development of the belief, lots of understanding of how that could happen. So I've got a little delay because I'm waiting for my slides to go. There we go. All right. So we've got another quote, y'all. Asia Marie Brown, one of my favorites from her book, Pleasure Activism, The Politics of Feeling Good, that talks about pleasure as a means and as a way to resist and to fight back and to create liberation for ourselves, especially for social justice activists and people of color. Liberated relationships are one of the ways that we actually create abundant justice. The understanding that there is enough attention, care, resource, and connection for all of us to access belonging, to be in our dignity, and to be safe in community. So one of the things we have to recognize is that white supremacy sends the message that there are scarce resources. There's not enough for everybody. And so because there's not enough for everybody, we've got to do what we can to hoard and to hold on to so that I can have, and that might mean that others do not have. And so that idea of scarcity, a lot of my clients of color have internalized. There's not enough for me. There's not enough relationship. There's not enough love. There's not enough money. There's not enough fill in the blank. And so what I work with my clients to to identify for themselves is what does liberation look like? What does relationship look like? What does abundance look like? And how do we cultivate that in your personal life, in your relationships? And how do we then move into creating that in a larger societal context? Okay. So um, Archer has written a book that is the anti-racist psychotherapy book. Mm -hmm. And it identifies based on Jung's work that there are five faces of oppression that we as therapists must identify and work to address in the work we're doing with clients. The first is that there is cultural imperialism. And cultural imperialism is centered around, again, the idea that whiteness is seen as the default and that everything else is othered around it. And so if we're going to push back against whiteness as the default, then we have to operate from a decolonization standpoint. We have to recognize the ways that folks have been disconnected from their own identities, the way that folks have been disconnected from their cultures, the way that they have been disconnected from a sense of self. And we're ultimately helping folks move from a place of internalized colonization and internalized racism and white supremacy to a place of, again, being more whole and more connected. That there's exploitation, right? And we talked about exploitation a little bit. This idea that for me to have, someone else must be disadvantaged, right? For me to have, someone else will be harmed. Right. And so to offset exploitation, we as therapists must be moving our clients in the work we're doing towards equity. So that looks like whose voices are we listening to and whose voices are we inviting into a room? It looks like what resources are we making sure are appropriately dispersed within the community? And how am I helping my client get connected to community and get connected to resource? How am I helping my client get into communities that are actually going to be validating and understand their, their experiences and support them? To counteract powerlessness, right? The inability, the inability to shift or change or impact experience or an outcome, my goal is to help clients get empowered. Right? And empowerment is about boosting the lived experience of individuals who differ from us. So how am I helping my client learn to tell their story? How am I helping my client identify what their strengths are and especially their strengths that are rooted in their cultural experiences? To replace marginalization and being pushed to the side and seen as an outcast or being excluded, I'm working to elevate. And again, this is making space for new voices, varied identities. It's the willingness to name the elephant in the room and talk about the hard things. 
It's the willingness to name, even if my client doesn't come in and say, hey, you know, it's been a really hard news cycle and another black person was murdered. It's me showing up in therapy and saying, hey, you may or may not want to talk about this. And I'm aware that this just happened yesterday. Is that something that we need to actually make time for in our time together? How is that impacting you? It's being willing to bring to the table the things that the client may or may not realize need to come to the table. And the last bit is compassion in response to violence. Right? How do we show up with a non-judgmental stance? How do we cultivate generosity and gratitude? How can I be mindfully present with my own experience so that I can regulate and manage that to create space for my client to be able to show up with their fullness, even if their fullness might be uncomfortable for me? I'm also working to validate my client's experiences and helping them find their kernel of truth and operating from a place where I see my client's system, symptoms, excuse me, within a broader system. So from an anti-racist therapy standpoint, there is the opportunity to weave in potentially some fundamental Afrocentric dimensions. And so the, what we've recognized is that there are certain ideas and concepts and cultural mannerisms that show up in more Afrocentric communities and also other cultures and communities of color that could be really beneficial in how we're doing our work with clients. The first is spirituality. Right? And this may or may not apply to all clients, but for some, we have to move in a place where we understand that folks have a belief in a force greater than themselves. And this can be rooted in religion. It can be outside of religion. And that ultimately within Afrocentric psychology, we're talking about the idea that the highest fulfillment of spirituality is coming into a place of harmony, harmony with our environment, harmony internally within ourselves harmony with relationships, and also moving from a place of materialism. Mm -hmm. We're talking about collectivism. It's the idea of interdependence and mutual cooperation. We're moving away from individualism as an extreme and trying to merge the two. Who are you as an individual and what does that look like in relationship and in community with other people? I'm recognizing that sometimes in communities of color, Time orientation is a little bit different. Sometimes, you know, we see past, present, and future all interwoven together rather than being solely future oriented. And so that means some people have heard of CP time, you know, where we might be running a little late because the way that we experience the moment is being in the here and now. So whatever's happening right now, that's what I'm focusing on, right? And I didn't. And also, additionally, excuse me, we're paying attention to how is right now impacted by the past? How might it also impact the future? We're talking about orality and what it means to honor family stories and cultural stories and narratives. What are the stories you've been told about your relatives that inform how you see yourself and how you see yourself within your family? What are the stories that you've been told that inform how you see your positioning in the world around you? There's sensitivity to affect and emotion, this idea that it is okay to show up with broad, full emotion. And so as I'm working with my clients who have borderline personality disorder to do emotion regulation, I want to honor a boldness. I want to honor vibrancy. I don't want to dampen that too much. If a person's angry, I want them to be as angry as they need to be and in an effective way. But I don't want to dampen and tell them that it's not okay to feel and it's not okay to feel big. You can feel big. You just can't act ineffectively in response to the bigness. We're also moving with verve and rhythm, right? There's a vibrancy that I wanna bring into the work that I'm doing with my clients and helping my clients connect to their own vibrancy and also being in balance and in harmony with nature. Being in harmony means noticing and operating within our wholeness. It means operating from a place of dignity and respect. It also means within Afrocentric dimensions that we pay attention to how we, the living, are connected to those who have transitioned and who have passed. 
What does it look like to do ancestral work with my clients if we're doing liberation work? How do we use family stories? How do we use a connection with the deceased family member as a resource and as a strength to help them get through hard times or to connect to universal truth or that internal wise mind truth that they have? So decolonizing is the psychological and emotional embodiment of reclamation. It's a sort of midwifery into ancestral healing. It's a return to ancestral healing while at the same time holding these institutions of Eurocentricity accountable. So what are the ways that we can identify systems and institutions that operate from a default of whiteness and other people Right? And how do we help folks reclaim their identity? How do I help folks become full and whole in their racial identities as well as all of the other intersecting identities? What does it look like to weave in a connection to the past? So what I wanted to leave you all with are a few ways that I weave in these concepts with the work that I'm doing with my clients. I want to say that these are questions that I ask and ideas and concepts that I explore with my clients who are Black, Indigenous, and folks of color, but I also ask these questions to my folks who are not, right? And so these are questions for everyone to sit with and explore, right? So we want to explore clients' experiences of microaggressions, discrimination, violence, and oppression. I want to invite that into the room. I wanna talk about prenatal and perinatal events that might have affected them or still affects them, right? What's happened within your history? What happened while you were in the womb that might still be impacting you and affecting you right now? I wanna to talk to my clients about what their awareness is and what the impact is of any historical trauma. What are the large cultural traumas that clients have known about and, it, and their families have experienced that still linger and impact them today? What's happened on an intergenerational line? What's happened within the generations within their families? And how does that inform how families show up? So for example, my grandmother, I love her, and she tends to be emotionally withholding. She has a long history of trauma. And her being emotionally withholding led to her feeling as though there wasn't space for her to be emotive with her kids. She loved her kids, but she wasn't a touchy-feely person. She didn't tell her kids, I love you, because she was focused on, we've got to survive in this world that doesn't like you, doesn't care about you, and is going to do everything it can to harm you. So my grandmother being withholding and feeling like that was the thing she needed to do to help her children survive in a world that was going to be emotionally withholding and potentially violent towards them led to me having a mother who is also, I love her, but emotionally withholding. She can give you positive emotion, but she does not know how to do negative emotion, right? How does that line of family trauma and experience, how does that impact how I show up in the world? How does that impact how I understand emotion, my own experience of emotion and relationship with others, right? These are the types of questions and also examples that I'm using in the work with my clients to help them explore these things. We're also talking about thoughts, feelings, beliefs, and concerns about working with a therapist of a different identity or different intersections? This is a question that I wanna encourage all of us to ask if we knowingly are working with folks that have a different identity than us. Do you have any questions for me, right? What does it feel like to be working with me as a cisgender therapist and you are a client, you're a person who is trans? Do you have concerns? Are there things you wanna know whether I know about? These are things that I actually wanna invite my client to ask and explore with me, okay? And also we're consistently clarifying if experiences are pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral. Because my association with particular words or language or experiences could be completely different than my clients, okay? So I don't wanna assume that I understand the nature and the nuance of their experience.
So the NAP Ministry is an organization I highly encourage you all to get to know. So you can find them on Instagram. And um, the NAP Ministry is centered around this idea of rest as resistance. What does it look like to disconnect from grind culture and this idea that we have to be in a cog and a wheel in a system that's centered on scarcity and production, right? And to instead allow yourself to rest so that you can recuperate and move towards liberation in your wholeness. And so one of the things that I really love about the NAP ministry is she talks about deprogramming, which is deconditioning or basically decolonizing our framework of ourselves. Right? And so she consistently gives us some really good questions that I use with my clients. When do you feel the most liberated? When do you feel the most loved? What is the soul? How do you feel connected to that concept? What would a community that is cared for look like for you? Additional questions for deprogramming, deconditioning, right? Decolonizing. What will it take for you to feel liberated? When do you feel the most human? When do you feel the least human? What are the ways your lineage and culture have experienced harm, invalidation, and vulnerabilities? And what are the ways that your lineage and your culture are connected to strength, to skillfulness, to resilience? I think oftentimes when we talk about um, ancestry and historical trauma with clients, we are consistently focusing on the negative. But one of the things that I do with the work with my clients is, how did your family survive? Clearly they made it, you're here. So there's strength, there's resilience, there's skillfulness that's in your lineage. How do we get connected to that? And how do you then use that as a way to support yourself as you move through your illness and reconnecting with yourself in the world? What helps you feel safe in relationships? What helps you feel joyful, grounded, connected? Where and how in your body do you experience your connection to your culture? When do you feel most and least connected? And so I touch my own skin and it tells me that before there was any harm, there was miracle. The work that I'm doing with my clients is to help them get reconnected to that core essence of themselves, right? To get reconnected to their true core self that can also be in healthy community with others, the part of them that is miracle. And so lastly, I just wanna leave you with a few ways as I'm teaching DBT skills with my clients, a few ways that I weave in some of these anti-racist liberation focused concepts in the skills work. When we're talking about stage one targets in DBT, life-threatening behaviors, therapy interfering behaviors, quality of life interfering behaviors, what I wanna explore with my clients is how does injustice and oppression impact and maintain these targets? If we're talking about the biosocial theory, we talk about historical, intergenerational, and cultural trauma. How might that impact a person's biological predisposition? How does it also impact how the community engages with them and how their social environment engages with them. When we're talking about inhibited grieving, I point out to my clients that we have to allow ourselves to fully grieve the losses, the harm, and any internalized white supremacy that we've been operating in. How have we functioned in a way that maintained a disconnection from our wholeness? And how do we then allow ourselves to fully fill into rage, grief, and fear that are all justified if you're experiencing oppression. When we're talking about wise mind, you say that wise mind is that merging of what's logical and our emotion mind, right? What, how does our emotion inform us? What do we feel? We also say that wise mind is connected to universal truth. It's connected to our intuition, right? Sometimes we just have a way of knowing things. And in the work that I do with my clients, Wise Mind expands to say, what are the ways of knowing that are connected to your culture, that are connected to your family, that are connected to your ancestry? What are the things that you know because you were born and bred to know it because of your lineage?
Pleasure activism is the work we do to reclaim our whole happy and satisfiable selves from the impacts, the delusions, and the limitations of oppression and or supremacy. And so as I work with my clients to move towards a whole self and also moving through hard emotions in crisis, we're consistently coming back to what does it look like for you to give yourself permission to experience pleasure? Oftentimes folks have been told that it's not allowed or they haven't been taught how to connect to it. And so what I want to help my clients know is that just showing up in the world as a person with a marginalized identity is political and it is an act of resistance. And so you staying alive is a way to push back against oppression. It's a way to push back against racism. And you also have to care for yourself in the process. So when we talk about self-soothing, right, tending to ourselves with our five senses. When we talk about doing pleasant events, I connect it to pleasure activism, that you experiencing joy is a way to fight back against oppression and white supremacy and capitalism, right? How do you show up and support your body? How can you operate from a bottom up perspective where you allow your body's wisdom to come forth and to guide you and not just operate from a cognitive or a top down way? When we're operating with imagery for crisis survival, what does it look like for you to connect and commune with your ancestors, right? Are there ways that you, when you're doing prayer, that rather than praying to God or your higher power, what does it look like to request and receive support from your ancestors, to call on strength from them as you're trying to get through and move through a crisis? When you need to take a break and give yourself a brief vacation, we're back to the nap ministry. Rest is resistance. And so if you truly are going to be able to show up in the world as your whole self, you got to be rested. And right? if you're going to fight back against oppression, you got to have energy. And so rest is required for that. What are the ways you can give yourself permission to step back? And if we're contributing to others as a way to survive crisis, to regulate our emotions, to bring down that intensity, what does it look like to operate from a place of advocacy? Right? What does it look like to offer community support and to offer mutual aid so that you can move to a place of feeling empowered, or you can also move to a place where you can see yourself as a member of a community? And when we're talking about interpersonal effectiveness with my clients, we talk about the importance of understanding family and social culture, because y'all, sometimes the way that DBT tells us we should use dear man, give fast, our interpersonal effectiveness skills are not always going to fly in certain families and in certain cultures. And so it's really important to keep that in mind as we're engaging with our clients and teaching them skills. What do these skills actually look like in action in the lives and the worlds that they live. And so lastly, I'll leave you with this idea. We need to learn how to practice love such that care for ourselves and others is understood as political resistance and as a way that we're cultivating resistance and resilience. Thank you. Thank you so much, Clarissa Cooper, for talking with us today about the important work you're doing and really doing an evidence-based treatment from this very anti-racist framework. This is so important, so long overdue, and we are just so thrilled to have you here with us. We've been getting questions coming in from the chat all over, and one theme has really come up. You just touched on it, and I wonder if I can ask you to expand on it a little bit. The question is, you know, what kind of adaptations can you make to the interpersonal effectiveness skills in DBT, knowing that the norms may be rooted or embedded in, in white supremacy? You were just touching on this. Could you expand that for us a bit? Yeah. So one of the things that I ask my clients to do when we're talking about interpersonal effectiveness are, what are the rules in your family? What type of communications tend to be supported and what type of communications are not supported? So in my family, if I said to my mother, mom, my feelings are hurt. I really wish you would say this in this other way. My mom would be like, girl, I don't care about your feelings. 
right? So that's just not going to work. However, if I can be really intentional and it's that reinforced part of Dear Man and play to my audience, I got to know my audience. What my mom does care about is how will other people perceive our family? That's something that matters mm -hmm. to oftentimes Black families, right? How do other people view us? So I can't say, mom, my feelings are hurt. I wish you would do this other thing in a different way. What I can say to my mom is, mom, you know, if I'm not able to talk to you about what my concerns are and ask you to see, to engage with me in a different way, I might have to go to others for support, right? And that is going to hook her because that's connected to her view that like, oh, well, I'd rather you talk to me first before you go and share our business with other folks. And so it's just a small example to say, you've got to know what the culture is and use that as a way to really angle your interpersonal effectiveness tools. Brilliant, thank you so much. It absolutely does, thank you. So Clarissa, we made an executive decision as you were speaking to um, hear your full presentation, which did cut into the question and answer time. But since the panel is just about to start, we figured that there would be options to ask the questions during the panel. Your um, intervention was so compelling that, um, that, that we decided to, to hear it till the end. We all wanted to do that. So it was a universal executive decision. So thank you so much. For, um, for your presentation.